from the major sins Ignore the whispers of a shaitan Oh Lord, have mercy on our souls Stay away, stay away from the major sins Ignore the whispers of a shaitan Oh Lord, have mercy on our souls Oh Lord, have mercy on our souls Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuhu. Brothers and sisters, welcome to a brand new episode 26 Ways to Be a Good Muslim Parent. We're looking at different pieces of advice from the Book of Allah, from the Sunnah of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam with regard to parenting, with regard to effective parenting, and also how we can get the most out of the investment that we place in our children. We invest our time, our effort, our money in order for them to be successful in this dunya, but how can we do the same in order for them to be successful in the akhirah? And indeed, in order for us to gain a portion of that success and a portion of that good, both in this life and in the time of the barzakh in the grave and on the day of judgment by the permission of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So this episode is all about good company, good friends. And I'm sure every single one of us as a parent is acutely aware of how important our children's friends and peers and the people that they spend time with are to their development. We've spoken in this series at length about how you as a parent can spend time with your child, influence your child, develop your child, control your child's upbringing. All of these things we've spoken about at length. And now it comes to looking at some of the external factors. Things that are maybe not directly in our control. That have a major impact upon our children. And perhaps the greatest of which is the issue of friends, company, peer group. So those people our children choose as friends. Or those people from their peers they are around. For example, the people they go to school with. Or the company the people who visit them in the house or visit the family in the house. How can we leverage this to be a better parent, to get a better result out of our child's upbringing? First, let's look at an ayah and a hadith. And the ayah is in Surah Al-Furqan, the statement of Allah Azza wa Jal, وَيَوْمَ يَعُضُّ الظَّالِمُ عَلَى يَدَيْهِ يقول يا ليتني اتخذت مع الرسول سبيلا يا ويلتا ليتني لم اتخذ فلانا خليلا لقد اضلني عن الذكر بعد اذ جاءني وكان الشيطان للانسان خذولا on the day when the oppressor will bite on his two hands and that shows a state of depression a state of sadness, a state of extreme regret that the oppressor will bite onto two hands and say how I wish I had followed the Prophet wasallam, that I had taken his way as my way that I had walked behind him on the path what was it that stopped him from following the Prophet wasallam? not his parents not his teacher not a school environment. Ya waylata laytani lam attaqid fulanan qalila. Woe to me, how I wish I had not taken this man as a friend. Why? You might ask, why did this friend have such an influence? What did this friend do? This khalil. And the khalil is a very close friend. Laqad adallani. He took me away, misguided me away from the remembrance of Allah after it came to me. 
وَكَانَ الشَّيْطَانُ لِلْإِنسَانِ خَذُولًا And the shaytan is ever to man a betrayer. He is ever betraying mankind. And of course the Khalil is one of the closest, if not perhaps the closest kind of friend that you can have. And I guess that shows us that the closer the friend is, the more potential influence that friend has to take you away from the remembrance of Allah or to bring you towards the remembrance of Allah. So while you should have concerns about your child's environment and you should have concerns about your child's peer group and you should have concerns about your child's class at school the biggest concern should be those who your child takes as a very close friend as a khalil and the worst kind of khalil the worst kind of close friend is the one who takes you away from the remembrance of Allah after it has come to you and in reverse the best kind of friend is the one who brings you to the remembrance of Allah even when you yourself are not making a movement towards it. And shaitan is ever betraying mankind. Shaitan's always there to betray. Shaitan's always there to take you away from the path. And so he puts around you friends who maybe are helping him and supporting him. And I said we would mention an ayah or a passage of ayat and a hadith. And the hadith is the statement of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam مَثَلُ الْجَلِيسِ الصَّالِحِ وَالْجَلِيسِ السُّوءِ كَمَثَلِ صَاحِبِ الْمِسْكِ وَكَيْرِ الْحَدَّادِ The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said the example of a good friend or a good companion and a jalees is someone you sit with so this is now less than a khalil the Khalil is the one of greatest concern, the closest of the close friends, the best of best friends. And the Jalis is the one that you associate yourself with, you sit together with, you go out together with. And there is Jalisun Salih wa Jalisun Su. Wa al Jalisu Salih and al Jalis as Su. The companion of piety and the companion of evil. The evil companion and the pious companion. The example of the pious companion is like the example of the perfume seller. Either you buy from them or you smell the fragrance of that beautiful perfume. So either you actually take some perfume from them directly and you end up holding that perfume and carrying that perfume or at the very least, you have a good smell around you, i.e. they benefit you directly or indirectly. Directly, like giving you a perfume or you buying a perfume from them. This is a benefit, this is something good, this is something beloved to Allah, there you go. Or indirectly, they don't give you a direct benefit, as in giving you something or you buying from them. But every time you are around them, at the very least, you smell good. So if we put this in a practical way, let's just imagine the issue of, let's say, the prayer. It may be that your good friend tells you, come on, let's do the voluntary prayers. Let's do a voluntary prayer after our obligatory prayer. Come on, let's pray the voluntary prayers. And in this case, it's like giving you the perfume. Or it may be that you just see them doing the voluntary prayers. So you see that whenever they finish the obligatory prayers, they do a voluntary prayer. And this is like smelling the perfume. You haven't started doing it yet yourself, but at the very least you see them doing good. What about the bad companion? The bad companion is like the one who works at the furnace of the Haddad, the blacksmith. Either he will set your clothes on fire or you will have the bad smell of the smoke of the furnace. So either he's going to set your clothes on fire, that's a direct harm. So he will take you for you to do the haram. He will take you by the hand until you yourself do the haram. Or you get the bad smell and the smoke. So this person hasn't made you do the haram, 
but you see them doing the haram. And you watch them doing the haram, and so there is a transfer of some of that evil towards you. And a fear that you would, if you haven't fallen into it today, then surely you will fall into it tomorrow. Just like the perfume seller, you didn't buy any perfume from him today, you just smelt the beautiful smell. Inshallah, tomorrow you will buy the perfume. He will give you some perfume. And the blacksmith, he just made your clothes smoky and horrible today and he'll set you on fire tomorrow. This is the example of Al-Jalis As-Salih and Al-Jalis as su The good companion and the bad companion. We're going to talk more about this inshallah ta'ala after the break and discuss about how we can apply this to our children and how we can, to what extent we should have control over our children's friends and how we can manage that and how we can know if they have good friends or bad friends. All of that is coming up inshallah after the break. Until then, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Marriage or divorce? What's Islamic ruling? Nikah. Solution or problem? Heaven or hell? Uh, there is a misconception. You choose. Beauty. Wealth. Family status, virtue. Decide what you want. Decide your choice. Be sad or be happy. It's your choice. Join Dr. Zakir Naik in Better Half or Bitter Half next on Peace TV. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuhu. Welcome back, brothers and sisters. We're talking about our children's friends. And in the first part of this episode, we talked about an ayah and a hadith. The ayah or the passage of ayat was regarding the oppressive person who will come on the day of judgment biting on their hands, saying, How I wish I had taken with the messenger away. Woe to me, how I wish I had not taken so and so as a friend. He misguided me away from the remembrance of Allah after it came to me and the shaitan is ever to mankind a betrayer. And we talked about the hadith of the good companion and the bad companion. So we recognize this for ourselves and for sure we recognize it also for our children and the need we have to help our children to have good friends. So how can we do this? I think there are a number of things to begin with. Right at the beginning, what is the home environment like? Because the home environment is a place where the child will spend a lot of time. And there will be acquaintances, friends at home, neighbors, family members, siblings. And the home environment is something parents have a lot of control over. Maybe parents don't have a lot of control over the friends your children make at school or at least a limited control of the friends that your children make at school. And it's more an indirect kind of control. You have to try and influence your child to choose the right friend as opposed to picking their friends and saying, your friends are Dawood and Muhammad and Abdullah and your friends are Fatima and Maryam and Aisha. It's more of an indirect thing. But in the home, you have more control. And so really at the beginning, you have to look at your home environment. If the home environment is one of religion, one of Islam, where the siblings are practicing Islam, the child is practicing Islam, the neighbors that are invited around are practicing Islam, and indeed the guests that come to the home generally are practicing Islam, then this is going to lead the child to be comfortable and familiar around people who are practicing Islam. That's one thing. The second thing is to start when your child is young. Really one of the keys to effective parenting that I believe personally is to start when your child is very, very, very young. 
if you expose your child to the wrong kind of friends when they're very young, it will be very hard for them to have the right kind of friends when they're older. Because the child forms likes and dislikes, hopes and dreams, etc., when they're very, very, very young. And so when they're very young and you have the wrong kind of friends around them, and at that age you have complete control over your child's friends. Because they're too young to really make any decision one way or the other. You have a lot of control over your child's friends. So now you have to make that decision and you have to try to direct your child to that which is best for them and to those friends who you think are going to be the best kind of influence over them. That's one further aspect. Start when the child is young and then as they are older, your control will gradually wean. It will gradually become weaker and weaker. You will not have the same control over them when they are 15 that you do when they are five. But if you fix things when they are three years old and two years old and four years old and five years old, then when they reach 15, 16, 17, 18, you have at least set them on the right path. Let's not also forget the importance of educating your child as to what is good and what is bad and positive encouragement and praise. All of these things will help the child to come towards loving, good Muslim friends. Someone might say, well, my child is doing all right in the house, but the biggest problem my child has is at school. And yes, we all know the options, change the school, put pressure on the child, but maybe you don't have the option to do that. So look at things another way. Do you have the option to divert your child to an activity out of school that will let them get good Muslim friends. So let's presume your child has not got very good friends at school and you're a bit concerned about that and you don't have a lot of options. You're pretty stuck in terms of changing the school. It's not really an option to change the school. You're pretty much stuck as you are. So we say in this case, all right, if you feel a little bit stuck, do you have the option to introduce your child to other friends in an alternative setting as an example to send them to masjid school or madrasa in the evening tahfid class quran class or to take them to a neighbor's house or a friend's house where they have good practicing muslim children in which this will provide them an alternative and so at least if they have a problem in school that problem is limited only to school when they're out of school, they want to spend time with those good Muslim practicing children as an alternative. So that's something to think about as well in terms of the providing an alternative scenery or an alternative setting for your children to get good Muslim friends. Having said that, be careful. Don't always equate madrasa with good Muslims or tahfid class, Quran class with good Muslims. Try to be aware and try to communicate with your child. And this is a fundamental part of parenting for a Muslim. Good communication with your child. To be aware of the kind of friends your child has and to discuss with them the kind of things that their friends do. Because even if you have a perfect set of friends for them, they are going to make mistakes. They're going to do things that are wrong. You know, they'll hear a swear word or they'll see a bad action especially as they get older, it's very hard to limit them from this. But if you are communicating with them about what is right and what is wrong, so the child naturally will set their own limits. I remember the story of a boy around about nine years old. And this boy was told, he knew that, that swearing, bad language was something that was wrong. And he began to play soccer, to play football with some of his friends and these friends began to swear when they missed the ball they would say a swear word so he said to those friends my mom and dad don't let me swear and swearing's haram in islam so i won't be able to play with you if you keep on swearing so the kids took this from him they didn't swear at him they said okay we won't when they kept on doing it a few times he said i have to go in because my mom and dad have told me that these are bad words, we're not allowed to say them, and you know, you guys are not stopping swearing, so I have to go in. 
the child automatically put their own limits as to what was right and what was wrong because they knew in the beginning the right from the wrong. And as we said, don't presume that madrasa is any better. Sometimes this is a big problem. Parents do all of the observation, the questioning, the communication, everything they should be doing with the state secular school. And with their tahfid class, the Quran class, they do absolutely nothing, presuming that all of the children in there are from the children of Jannah. And that's not always the case. So just as you send your children to school and you're cautious about who they mix with, likewise, you need to also be cautious who they mix with in Islamic schools because there are good Muslim kids and bad Muslim kids and we all know this. This communication is really, really important because you will find as your child gets older, you have less control over who your child chooses as a friend. Early intervention in this is quite important. If you find your child has a friend that's really bad for them, getting to that problem early before they become really close friends is often the reason why you can get your child out of it. Intervening early. If you're not aware of what's going on, you're not spending time with your child, you're not communicating with your child, then the problem is that you won't recognize when these bad friends come along and be able to get them away early. Imagine this scenario. Imagine your child meets a bad friend one or two days. They come and tell you about some of the things that child did and you say to them, that's not a good person. Well, this child has done so much haram. I think you know, it's better for you that you don't mix with them. Then look at another scenario. They've been playing with this child for four to six months. Let's say six months. Playing with this child day and night for six whole months. Been doing this haram with them for six months. And then you say to them, you shouldn't have this person as a friend. Look at the difference between the first scenario and the second scenario. In the first scenario, your child may well leave that friend within the day. It's not a big deal for them because there's no real attachment to it. After six months, they've become close. They've become very close friends, very good friends. And it's quite hard for your child after that to leave them. So bear that in mind as well. Being aware, being in control, early intervention. Try to involve your child in the decision-making process of their friends. You can't say to them at an older age, you can have him, him, and him as a friend. Her, her, and her as a friend. It doesn't work like that. What you can do, though, is to slowly, let's say, influence their friendship in a way that if you have a very good relationship with your child, which you should have by following what we've mentioned, a good relationship with them, that you talk to them as a friend. These guys are not good for you. They're not, they're not helping you. They're not getting you closer to Allah. What do you think? So by involving the child, and by saying to the child, what do you think? So the child comes back and says, yeah, but you know, no, 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 they are good. They're good people. Yeah, but look, you told me they did this haram and this haram. That's not good, right? Yeah, okay, yeah, I suppose so, it's not good. But the point is here, the child is involved. It's not, you're not allowed to see Abdullah anymore. Because that will often create a lot of negative feelings among the child. Sometimes it's necessary. I mean, if, this, if your child is in serious danger of something or serious haram, there's no choice but to just block them. But if you can intervene early and you can talk to your child, involve your child, Make your child a part of the question, a part of the answer. Well, what do you think? How do you think things have gone? What do you think about this person? Do they do this? And your child already has a habit of being truthful with you. And your child already has a good relationship with you and a strong bond with you. And you spend time with them and you play with them and you take them out. Then automatically you're in a much, much better situation to discuss with your children about the kind of friends that they have. This is a long topic and I'm sure we will touch upon the topic of friends over the remaining episodes in the series once again. But that's all we have time for in this episode. And until next time, I leave you in the care of Allah. Wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Stay away, stay away from the major sins. Ignore the whispers of the shayatins. Oh, Lord.